All right, so it looks like the the counting up number is slowing down a little bit, so we'll get started. Um, I'll say it again, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our third installment of the Analytics Enthusiast webinar series. Um, so my name is John Lin. Uh, I am a recruiting manager and business development manager at Birchworks uh, and, and one of the co-organizers of uh, the Analytics Enthusiast group. Uh, for those of you that have never joined us before, uh, the Analytics Enthusiast group uh, its mission is to bring together uh, analytics, data science, and marketing research professionals to share ideas, insights, and perspectives with others through a thought leadership community. Uh, and we're so excited to have um, Jenny, Liz, and Randy here today uh, to share a great topic for us um, titled, How to Advance Your Data Science or, or Analytics Career and Move into Leadership Positions. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, Jenny, um, you know, we've been running this now for since the beginning of this year and had a lot of success and gotten a lot of great feedback. So if you are out there and you have any interest in, in being involved in the analytics enthusiast groups at all, uh, either through a presentation or you have a, a topic or something you'd like to learn more about, uh, please reach out to us. Um, the, the email, the best email is analyticsenthusiasts at birchworks.com or you can feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or shoot me a note on LinkedIn. Um, looking forward to the presentation today, and, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny. Thanks, John. Well, my name is Jenny Schmidt, and I have the privilege of kind of hosting this panel today. So I'm gonna do a quick introduction and then let Liz and Randy introduce themselves as well, and then we'll get going. I'm ready to pick their brains and excited to provide some, some value for all of you that are with us today. So I am located in Des Moines, Iowa. I am an HR professional by nature with an accounting background, um, but a proud Iowan. If you haven't been to our state, you should head our way. We are not just the flyover state or the place that you should come for sure. But I uh, have lived in Iowa almost my whole life. I do have an accounting degree and an MBA with an emphasis in strategic management and organizational behavior. And I currently spend my time mostly as an analytics career coach. So I love working with people, helping them to take that next step in their career. My my niche really is analytics and data science professionals, um, so I don't I don't stray too much from that. I got into this field. I had a long career from my perspective at John Deere. I was there for 16 years, started in accounting. I made a pivot in my career into the HR department and ended up working on a task force with um, several analytics leaders. They were giving guidance to senior leadership on how analytics was gonna shape the strategy. Now this was many years ago, but I felt very honored to be picked to be on that task force representing the human resources department and really talking about the talent implications of the strategy and I got hooked. This analytics topic is just fascinating. Uh, it's constantly changing. There are all, all kinds of careers that really have developed into this field and I'm excited to be here to really pick two amazing analytics leaders, Liz and Randy's brains, and to help all of you as you're thinking about your career and your next steps. And so with that, Liz, would you kind of kick off your introduction? Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure thing. It's good to see you, Jenny. Um, so similarly, um, my the bulk of my career has actually been at John Deere, um, but I'll start back just a little bit further. Uh, so my background is in economics and math. And my career started as an economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, working for the federal government. And then I moved on to John Deere and was actually there for also 16 years. I didn't know we had that in common, Jenny. So, and I often say that I started as a practitioner, um, but that was way before they called anybody a data scientist. So I had all kinds of wonky titles early in my career. Uh, so I was a practitioner in what we now call data science and analytics. I was both on the manufacturing side of the business as well as the sales and marketing side of the business. And then I worked up to leadership roles. I probably have been in, in some form of a leadership role over the past decade or so. I'm also both on the manufacturing side and the sales and marketing side within John Deere. So have seen and led teams that work on data science and analytics for what I say is on the business type problems and I'm working on data science in the product. So those have different pipelines in many ways and so happy to share experiences or thoughts there. Uh, and then I also made a pivot about a year and three months ago and now I'm based in Indianapolis, Indiana 
and work at Delta Fawcett Company, where I am the Senior Director of Strategy, Insights, and Advanced Analytics. So uh, still leading teams in the advanced analytics and data science space, uh, but my scope is a bit larger with pricing and strategy as well. Yeah, Liz and I go way back. We were on that similar task force I left, and then as she said a year ago, she left. And I actually met Randy several years ago as well at an analytics conference. And it, Randy brings a different perspective. He's worked at a couple different places. So Randy, tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. Sure, so Randy Guzzi. So I'm uh, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, but originally from Wisconsin. And I have 16 years John Deere uh, experience as well, but mine was actually driving the tractors. So I grew up on a family farm. So for 16 years uh, was was there. Um, undergraduate in um, mathematics and business from Concordia University, Wisconsin. And then I got a master's in statistics from the University of Minnesota. Um, and then uh, just kind of briefly through from there, I went and joined uh, Land's End as a data scientist. Well, it was called statistician back then, but really it's what data scientists do today. So we we're just kind of ahead of our time. Uh, spent four years there in that role and then um, joined Carlson Companies as an analytics consultant and spent the next 16 years at Carlson Companies doing analytic consulting for a lot of Fortune 500 companies. Um, that got spun off into a company called AMIA and uh, after about, uh, like I said, 16 years there, decided to join United Health Group um, in a different, uh, several roles there. So the last seven years I've been with United Health Group, United Healthcare, Optum. Uh, my current role is with uh, data science learning initiatives in the organization. So that's in a whirlwind. That's that's uh, brings up to speed with uh, my background. Thank you, Randy. So a tip: you don't have to work for 16 years at the same company before pivoting. Uh, it just is a weird coincidence that all of us had that in their career, in our careers. So you know, hopefully, those of you that are joining us today are anxious to learn about your next step in your career, and we're specifically going to really focus on that step into a leadership position. You know, I work with a lot of clients who have aspirations to do that, and also some that say, "I don't ever want to do that." And then all of a sudden they get into their job, they really like their boss and some opportunities come up and then it's like, well, do I wanna do that or how can I advance in my career? So there's a lot of aspects to this topic of moving into a leadership position. So I'm curious, uh, Randy and Liz, did you always want to be a leader? You know, a lot of people in this field are kind of introverted and had, didn't have aspirations of, you know, changing the world. So could you share a little bit about if you always wanted to be a leader, why or why not? So Randy, will you go first? Sure. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll go kind of back to the origin. So as I mentioned, I grew up on a family farm. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college. So I, I had, you know, no aspirations, you know, no expectations at all actually going into my career journey. Um, it, it was kind of learn as you go, you know, because I, I really didn't have any mentors or any, any, um, uh, you know, uh, networking to, to like we have now, right? So internet didn't exist, email didn't exist. I didn't even really know what kind of job functions were out there. So it, to me, it was a learning journey from like square, from like day one. And it, it's been an amazing journey. And, uh, you know, kind of, as you're saying, learning and pivoting as you go, continue making these adjustments. But um, yeah, I, I kind of started right from, right from scratch and kind of figured it out as I went. What about you, Liz? So I don't know if, uh, you know, back in, in grade school or high school, if I knew I wanted to be an analytics leader, but I did know that I wanted to talk about math because I am an extrovert who likes math, which don't always go together. So maybe the idea was seated at an early age. And that was actually why I studied economics, because it seemed to be a, um, a blend of where I could apply uh, that skill set in business. And so I don't know that I would have identified like, yes, I want to be a leader, but once I got the opportunity uh, to lead in the analytics space and, and applied in business, I was hooked, uh, similar to the way uh, I think Randy said that. Um, and I was hooked because I got to see how much change we could drive by bringing a new capability into the business. That was wildly exciting. And then um, so just being able to work with talent uh, with diverse backgrounds, that's something that we really get the benefit of doing 
um, particularly in the early years of my career because um, nobody really knew how to title the positions or what pedigree they were looking for. And I still think we have that benefit because you can bring together folks, whether you have a stats background, a math background, maybe a comp sci background, and now they're even data science programs, and blending those skill sets together is really exciting to see what the teams come up with. Perfect, yeah, so anybody can really do this, as evidenced by Randy and Liz, introverts and extroverts alike. You don't have to always have the childhood dream of ruling the world. Um, a lot of people in their career just take it step by step. So those of you joining us today might be at that point where you're like, yeah, I think I do wanna take this next step into leadership. And as Randy and Liz both talked about, oftentimes it's when an opportunity presents itself or when you know that's what you want for your next move, that makes it happen. Uh, I do talk to a lot of people that aren't sure about this leading other people thing, you know, um, building the algorithms, doing the coding, that sounds really comfortable and it's something that you're used to. So I would like to hear, Randy, from you, if you could give some advice for data scientists or other analytics professionals who are maybe considering making this move, what should they consider, what should they think about, and what might surprise them about what it's really like to be one of those leaders? Sure. So I, I would say, you know, first thing to focus on is, is kind of all of those skills that are not data science and, and think about what those skills are. So, you know, thinking about, you know, how organizations function, you know, uh, different skills around, you know, interpersonal communications and, and just communications in general. You know, if, if you're somebody who kind of enjoys having conversations with individuals and, and um mentoring and networking you know, those are all things you have to do as a leader and and things you may not have practiced very much as a data scientist because i'll say early in my career as a data scientist i was all about the technical i'm like technical skills i you know i know sas i you know we didn't have python back then but i, I knew spss i knew sas um you know i'm valuable to any organization that's all i need right but once i got into a leadership position i'm like oh no that's not nearly sufficient there's all these other skills that need to be polished in order to be successful as a leader. I really appreciate that answer. As an HR professional, I've spent almost all of my career uh, helping organizations and employees work on the non-technical parts of it because oftentimes we do maybe not discount it, but a lot of the clients that I work with and students, when we talk about that relationship part or the people part, the answer is either, oh yeah, I'm good at that. Or kind of what you were saying earlier in career, I mean, I'm decent enough. I don't really need it for the type of work that I'm doing. Um, but the reality is no matter where your career path is going, there is always room for improving the ability to work with other people. Um, it's what I do as a career coach. I don't help people learn how to code in Python, but I do help them to learn how to work with other people. It's an essential skill. And if you're saying to yourself, but I don't know if I have that, it's okay, that is the most learnable skill there is. If you can learn how to code in Python, you can learn how to work with people. Where there's a will, there's a way. It's just a matter of finding those mentors and coaches in your life that can help you with it. And along those lines, you know, some of you also might be kind of questioning your own confidence, right? Like, well, I know I wanna take that next step, but maybe I haven't ever supervised before, or I just am not super confident that I can do that job. So Liz, would you be willing to share a little bit about your background? Was there ever a time when you maybe got offered an opportunity or went for a job promotion where you really didn't feel qualified, but kind of you went for it anyway? Sure, but I don't tell people that, Jenny. No. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, I'll maybe kind of go back to when I was trying to figure out if I was interested in managing people, because like I said, I. I was interested in being able to talk about the numbers and I am thankful that as an analytics leader, I still get to do that. So um, I'm a firm believer in leaders in tech being technical. So I still keep my hands in some data sometimes, not near as much as I used to, but um, that is something that has always been important to me because uh, I didn't want to fully go away from it and just move into a general manager role. Uh, and so when I first got the opportunity to do that, it was actually managing an intern. And that is something that sometimes we might shy away from because it might seem like it's not um, as exciting work or it's, it's not work that you're gonna get to do for a long time, but totally grab on to those opportunities. Um, I would also tell you, I learn a tremendous amount still working with our interns that are using the latest technologies and I'm just really excited to dig in. So uh, you'll learn something about how you manage, whether you like it or not, 
Um, and you'll probably have just a really great opportunity to work with somebody who's kind of fresh in school. Uh, so I've, I would encourage that. And then taking the risk uh, of managing a team for the first time. Uh, so somebody had to take a risk on me uh, or take a chance on me because uh, I hadn't managed people before. But if you have some of those small experience, whether it's with a contractor or with an intern, that's great. Um, and then make sure that you have a network of mentors to ask questions because, and, and I would highly, highly encourage, and you're the career coach, Jenny, but I always encourage both internal and external mentors because sometimes inside our organization, we might not be willing to be as vulnerable to ask those questions about management because we don't want to admit what we don't know in the process. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons that you may not want that internal mentor. So look for external mentors. I appreciate that advice. Yeah, spot on, right? Especially in today's world. I mean, the statistics show that people do change jobs and change companies. And you are both an example of that. Um, you know, when I started my career, quite a few years ago, it was you can work for this company and retire here. And that's just not the environment we work in today. As much as we might love the company we work for, um, being open to saying, I never know what may come along. So I'm going to keep kind of my network open outside of just my existing company. Liz, as you were talking, it made me think of this term myth buster. And I thought, oh gosh, we could have called this webinar myth busters. So one myth, right, is you need to be an extrovert in order to be a leader. And this is not true. Randy's a good example of that. I feel like another myth, people believe that if they go into a leadership position, they will no longer get to do any technical work. There's a big fear. I mean, you, you come into the data science world because you love doing data science. Well, if you go into management, you aren't going to be coding all day long, but maybe you don't want to go to zero, right? You don't want to go from 100 to zero. And so what I heard you say is you also still like getting into it, you know, getting into some data, solving some problems, and it's probably changed throughout the years. But would you kind of validate that that's a myth that if you go into management it goes down to zero and you don't get to do any of that fun stuff anymore yes definitely a myth um, every experience i've had granted i'm i'm talking really about three locations and two where i was in a leadership position and um, but it, if you desire to have that kind of hands-on i'm sure you can find it and i would say that that is generally the theme that i see not just in data science but across technical positions and some go from leading teams back to an IC or an individual contributor for a period of time um, and weave in and out. And that's OK if you have an environment and, and a career track like that. Randy, would you add kind of your perspective to this? You've had a couple different leadership positions and work with a lot of leaders, right? So what's your thoughts on if you go into leadership, you're done with technical work? Is that no, true? You're definitely, yeah, no, you're definitely not done with technical work. Um, as, as long as you're in still a, a data science uh, unit or organization, um, you know, the, the companies revolve around data right now. So I would, you know, use an analogy of, um, let's use a data analogy. Data has different levels of granularity. So it could be at a very detailed granular level, or it could be rolled up to a, a higher level, summarized, continue to roll up. So as a leader, you're going to operate in more of those summarized, rolled up areas. So if you're leading a team, you're going to be looking at the solution from a higher level, but still a technical level, and looking for those things within the project that could derail it. And those could be both technical and non-technical things. So you have to pay attention to both the technical and the non-technical. And um, the way I kind of like to characterize it is you're looking for those you know, um, unintended consequences. What could go wrong? And, and those are technical problems and those are also non-technical problems. But, but a big part of it is, is the technical. Perfect. Myth busted, right? <laughs> you still get to work on technical even if you move into a leadership role. Well, Liz, you mentioned the importance of mentorship, right, within the company and outside of the company. And I know, Randy, it's really big on your heart to help the younger generation, right, to those maybe that are pursuing a degree or starting their career. Randy, do you have any advice for someone that says, okay, I, I heard your message. I know I need to get a mentor. How do I find one? How do I just ask some, you know, somebody off the street, if you will? Randy, any advice for someone that's looking to get a mentor, how they would actually find one? Yeah, so I mean, um, so if you're looking for a mentor, I would start, you know, look through your existing network. So maybe it's a, it's a, it's a prior, um, you know, a manager that you had. So if you're, you know, kind of in the mid stage of your career, there might be somebody you had who's in a different role right now, but still knows you fairly well. Re-engage with them because they're going, to, you're going to have a head start already. 
So that that's kind of an ideal mentor is, is somebody who already knows you. Um, you know, if you don't have that, then, you know, you have to start a little bit, you know, further um, away networking wise, but you may want to, you know, it's a little bit harder now because we're all virtual, but I think we're kind of getting back in person. But attend the analytics events and, and get to know individuals who have common interests of, of, of what they, of you and kind of build those relationships. So that could be either within your organization or outside your organization. I encourage you to do both, um, but seek out those individuals with, with common interests and you can start from there as well. Perfect. Love the advice. It, a phrase came to mind as you were talking, uh, dig your well before you're thirsty. So for those of you that maybe aren't ready for a mentor right now, do the networking part, right? I am such a big proponent. I get the opportunity to teach a class at the University of Chicago called Your Career in Data Science. And we talk about networking a lot. It is something that I underestimated earlier in my career, um, networking not just within the company, but outside of the company. Because it's amazing within two decades, how many of the leaders might be gone. They changed jobs, they retired. Uh, so it's so important to build your network. And Randy had some great suggestions on how to do that. So for those of you maybe that aren't necessarily wanting to mentor, you know, 2021, start building those relationships and that network because you never know who's going to get promoted or who might be able to help you along the way. I do want to encourage those of you, if you have questions, make sure that you put those um, in the Q&A. John, our host, is monitoring those. And so thank you for the question about how to find a mentor. I'll continue to keep an eye on those and we'll answer them as we go. So if you do have questions, I just want to encourage you to ask those. Uh, this is awesome. I feel like time is flying by already. I have so many questions that I want to go through. Let's pivot a little bit to skills. So it was referenced, right, this concept of building your technical skills, but also needing those interpersonal skills. So um, I have a client, in fact, that says, you know, I applied to a leadership job a couple of times and I didn't get it. So there must be something missing. And, and I also have some students that I work with that say, you know, I want to get into leadership someday. What can I do now? What specific skills should I be focused on working? And maybe how can I work on those um, in order to prepare myself to be the best candidate and ensure that I'm going to be the, the person that gets chosen for the job? So Liz, let's take it back to you. What advice do you have as far as skill building for those that are looking to make this move into leadership? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, Randy referenced a few earlier, kind of those non-technical skills. And there is an emerging field that we often refer to as storytelling uh, or synthesizing information. So as technical uh, folks, and I'm going to put myself in that bucket too, uh, we often get really enamored by those technical details. And we have to be able to step out of that and ensure that we have kind of a a connection to the business problem and are able to connect our technical work to that to tell the story of how that should be pulled through to action in the business. So there are a number of resources out there around this concept of storytelling. And I would also combine that with ensuring that we're, we're being thoughtful on the visualizations that we put forth because they are often the first thing that would be looked at in any material. So I'm just being thoughtful about how we visualize that information. Again, there are lots of resources available around data visualization, how that applies in business. I, I would say those, those two things. And then as uh, something that might be a little bit more comfortable to build your business acumen as you're approaching leadership positions uh, would be take a look at the company's annual report. I know we've all heard that when we go through some type of interview coaching, but that is a great place to start if you're somebody that is uh, quantitatively minded uh, to start understanding the company through its numbers. So I would highly encourage that still. I don't know if that was generic advice given back in the day, but it is very applied. Uh, I expect that when we're talking to candidates be, that they have done some research about the company and have done it through the lens of our financials. Liz, you referenced some resources. Do you have any examples? I mean, is it like a Coursera or a LinkedIn Learning or, yeah, where can someone go to get some of these non-technical skills? So those are the two resources I would have put out there. And okay. not that I am advertising for either one of them, but I still take Coursera classes and LinkedIn Learning. They're often very applied and, and on LinkedIn Learning, you can find pretty short ones too. 
Perfect. Randy, what about you? Could you give some maybe a little more specifics as far as what skills and then kind of like Liz was talking about too, where, where can you go to actually develop those? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll, I kind of take this, you know, uh, start with generalizing a little bit, actually. Um, and a lot of people probably heard about a personal brand. And if you haven't heard about your personal brand, um, it's something you want to explore. So even as a technical, um, you know, contributor, you have a personal brand. And that, thinking about that will then um, kind of give you some information, some insight into what skills you need to polish to support that personal brand. And those could be more technical skills. So if you want to be the, you know, the, the best Python coder there is out there, you want to get to the most advanced Python courses that you can, right? So, um, so those, those are skills that are going to support your brand. If you're going to be a, a more general purpose data science leader, well, you want to be well-rounded. So you don't want to know just Python. You probably also want to know a little bit about other languages, even SAS. A lot of companies still use SAS. It's a legacy language. A lot of departments are being very productive about that. So if you don't know that, then you should get some background in that because not every leadership position is going to be leading a Python team. It, it could be leading a software engineering team. So you may need to know about Java and how to implement data science projects. So you have to kind of figure out like what data science is such a broad field um, and it's getting broader all the time. So you have to kind of figure out where's your niche and what skills do you need to support that? And then that's kind of digging deeper and okay, where do I go to get those? And we already listed some great resources. Perfect, yeah. As you were talking, it reminded me of a model I use with my clients when I do consulting work, when they were talking about how to build skills and analytics teams, I break it out into four buckets. One is business acumen, one is data, one is visualization, and then one is the math and the actual algorithms. And so if you think of like a scale of one to 10, where are you personally on those four areas? What is already your natural strength? And what is the area that you want to build and grow in? And all kinds of resources, as we've mentioned, in all four of those areas, just depending on what you're already bringing to the table. I'm a big believer in focusing on your strengths and not your weaknesses. And as we talk about moving to that next level, it's really easy to go, oh gosh, I'm not so great at that or I'm not so good at that. But really focus on how do I take my strength as a coder, take my strength as a storyteller and bring that to the table to show that I can lead the group using my strength as, as the go-to. Uh, Randy and Liz, we had a question from the audience. So I want to just read this to you to pose it up um, rather than try and summarize it. So the question was kind of a setup. I'm curious about moving into newer technologies. This person works in an industry which tends to be very technologically conservative. And the person's trying to move into a similar position at other organizations, but they all seem to require newer technical experience. Randy, you just kind of mentioned SaaS, right? Some people are like, oh yeah, SaaS totally there and other companies are like we do not use SaaS anymore right so what is your advice to combat that if somebody's at an organization that maybe isn't using the newest technology and yet they're trying to get a job at a place that does so randy yeah. will you take a shot at that first sure so um you know i, I think that the place to start there is um you know determining if if that's the right move for you Right, for as, as an individual. So assuming that is, that you're gonna make the conversion from SAS to Python, then you, you wanna start with the equivalent skills within Python that you're using within SAS. So the, the data science process is the same regardless of what software you use. So I think we're all familiar with like the CRISP data mining process been around for decades. If, if you're not familiar with it, definitely get familiar with it. It's universal across any software. So you go back to the basics, like, okay, how do I do the whole data science lifecycle process with the new technologies? And you'll be surprised at how similar it is. Like the code is different, but the process is the same. So it's kind of like just learning a new language, you know, verbally, if you, if you know, you know, uh, the, the commonalities between like French and Spanish, there's they all have like these Latin roots. And I think a lot of the statistical language is the same. You'll start noticing these commonalities and it's, it's structured very similar, just the syntax is a little different. Great, Liz, anything to add on from your perspective? Yeah, it would maybe, and I think this is kind of the same spirit that Randy had, is that if you don't have that core skill, build your familiarity in the tool. So don't just say, I haven't done it, I haven't learned it. <clears throat> there are ways, again, we've, we've referenced some online resources 
that you can get yourself a primer, uh, especially to these open source tools that are, are easy to get access to. So practice. I mean, I was also formally trained in SAS uh, and I didn't learn Python in school. I learned Python after I was in a leadership role because I wanted to make sure that I was at least somewhat familiar uh, with the coding languages that my teams were using. Liz, could you expand on that a little more? So let's say, I don't know, like, do you tell your boss you want to learn, learn, let's say, Python? Do you do it undercover after hours? Uh, you know, how does that actually work almost like culturally with the team that might be that you might be a part of right now? Yeah, great question. It probably does depend on, on the environment or the culture that you're in. And I was very uh, fortunate in the culture that I was in to have kind of that culture of continuous learning. So if I wanted to block out a couple hours a day to learn something new, um, you know, for a period of time, I could do that. And or I'm sure I also did some after hours myself. Uh, but if you don't feel that you are supported in your current environment to get that type of continuous learning, maybe just ask. You might be surprised. Most companies, uh, at least, you know, with, as I talk to my peers, we are all very interested in helping to upskill our current workforce into new technologies. So you really might be surprised if you ask. Yeah, the work that I do with analytics leaders and HR professionals continues to be around this shortage, like you talk about upskill. I mean, there really does seem to be this general consensus. We don't have enough people that know how to do this work. And also the general idea of we want to progress our organization forward, right? The, it's not going to get less digital, right? We're going to have more data, more of our processes within our organizations, regardless of the industry, is going to move more towards digital, more towards data. And so oftentimes I hear employees say, oh, my, you know, I didn't tell my boss I'm getting a master's degree in analytics or I didn't want anybody to know. And again, it's possible that the culture in your organization is such that that would negatively impact you. But I would guess most organizations, they want to know about you. You're like a diamond in the rough. Like what? We have an employee that wants to try out a new technology or is actually interested in analytics and we don't even know about it because they didn't tell anyone. Um, your leaders are going to support you in that learning because they benefit too. That means they don't have to go try and recruit somebody. They can just help you. You already have the business acumen. You already know about the company and now it's just gaining these new data science skills. Um, so yeah, I encourage all of you, if it's possible, to be open with your current boss, coworkers, HR and learning departments in order to gain those skills because um, it really can help you not just in that next move but down down the road as well. well we've talked you know kind of bounce oh Liz did you have something? Well no, I was going to add one more piece there if you are in a large organization where maybe there are opportunities to use technologies that aren't in your department you can also um, this is something I was very fortunate to have when we were at John Deere uh, you could also look for kind of co-working or co-project type skills. So where you get an opportunity to maybe work on a project that is very applied with a different technology. So you can also seek out development opportunities too within your organization. So it might not just be taking a course, if you will. Yeah, because like you said, you know, you were trained formally in SAS, right? Well, people, there's no stopping it. If a new technology comes out 10 years from now, you don't have to go back and get a master's degree in that. You learn on the job. You learn by taking initiative on your own, by finding those courses out there. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. But then also utilizing your strength, which is, uh, you know, if you're already in a working environment, the data that you have at your fingertips and the opportunities that might exist in your current organization. Well, we've talked a lot about kind of progressing in your career, whether it's at your current organization or maybe looking to to change companies. You know, it can be kind of intimidating if you're looking to change companies to figure out where to go. Um, I mentioned I had, you know, a long tenure with John Deere, but I actually left the company to go get my MBA. And so I was on a leave of absence and really was going through these self request, you know, self reflection questions. Do I want to go back to that company or do I want to try, try another company? Right. But man, is it intimidating to evaluate? Is that a company that matches what I'm looking at? You know, for me personally, I was looking at 
a company that really valued employees. I was looking to go into an HR capacity and really wanted kind of work-life balance and, you know, realizing people have families and just very supportive from an employee perspective. But it's hard to Google that, right? You know, you have fortunes, best companies to work for. There's different lists. So what advice do you guys have? You've both changed companies in your careers. How can somebody really kind of vet what company they might want to work for or um, have in their aspirations for a career move. So Randy, could you share a little bit? I know you've been at uh, United Healthcare for a little while now, but what advice would you give to someone who's trying to figure out that company aspect? Yeah, so yeah, I think you hit on a, a few of the points there of, of doing the research. So some of it can be hard to find, it can be buried. So you may have to talk to individuals, you know, so you can get some information online, um, for, about the company culture, but then you have to talk to individuals. One thing that um, to, to kind of determine as you're doing your research is, especially this is true with large organizations, there's kind of an umbrella culture, but then there can be subcultures within the organization. So culture is a very dynamic thing and, and, and very subject to interpretation. So the larger the organization is, the more uh, um, dispersion there's going to be in the interpretation of the culture. Which, which definitely makes things interesting uh, in, in a large organization. So, you know, the, the data science team may have a very different subculture within that group than say um, a software engineering team, which tends to live kind of more, you know, data science a little closer to the business, software engineering is a little bit closer to the tech. Sounds like very similar teams, but they may have very, they may have quite different cultures with, within within those teams. So you kind of have to do, do your digging. And a lot of it comes down to, uh, you really not going to find out until you kind of get to network and talk to people who are in those roles and uh, and kind of get that firsthand knowledge. Thanks for the plug on networking. Did you hear that? Networking, super important. And again, um, I'm sure a lot of you are not old enough to understand the concept of seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, but I talk about this a lot, right? I mean, the concept was, if you wanna know how connected you are with this famous actor, Kevin Bacon, you can just go, well, I know so-and-so, who knows so-and-so, who knows so-and-so, and with seven degrees, I think you're connected with like anyone in the world. I mean, it's pretty crazy. And I see that all the time, especially with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an amazing tool when it comes to connecting to connecting to connecting um, because you can kind of narrow down and do a little bit of your research yourself. And so if you say, well, I want to go work, um, you know, at Optum, I want to go work at United Healthcare. Who do I know that works there? Well, you might not personally know someone that works in data science. Well, now you do, you know, Randy, right? Um, in that organization. But you might know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody, right? And so it's just starting to ask that question, hey, I'm looking to you know, find out more about what it would be like to work there. Do you know anybody? No, I don't, but I think so-and-so used to work there, right? And be able to use that network in order to, to grab those. Um, we're almost wrapped up kind of with the formal questions. I didn't prepare Liz and Randy for this, but I'm gonna throw you guys a curveball. Uh, Liz talked about this at the beginning, and I would like both of you just to share, what do you love about being a leader? Uh, I wanna hear some passion coming out. Maybe if there's a story in there, like, man, this happened and it was just like the best day ever. Uh, so Liz, kick it off, like bring all that energy. What do you love about what you do? I love accelerating change with analytics. I mean, it is so exciting. Even, um, you know, coming, well, let me back up just a little bit. Part of what drove my change, so we were talking about kind of changing companies, is that I really looked for some specifics. So it wasn't just about culture for me. I was looking for a, a company that was very early in its analytics and digital journey. And because I am so inspired to drive that change, like I am motivated by that and I realize that that's what gets me excited. So. I looked for a company like that and then asked those questions about culture and, and work-life balance, et cetera. But I was looking for um, specifically a company that was in the manufacturing industry and early in its journey. And you found it and you're loving every day. <laughs> Perfect. What about you, Randy? Yeah, you know, so what's really great about, you know, data science leadership is just as Liz said, the pace of change. So, you know, th this field looks nothing like it did five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's going to look vastly different five and 10 years from now. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy that progression of it, it's always, it's always good. What's next? What's new? I'm kind of an early adopter. Um, but, but also, 
tend to hold on to technologies as well. So I kind of like span the whole gamut of early adoption to, you know, uh, what are the legacy technologies? How can we leverage all of them to their fullest extent? Well, that's that you know, like feeds right into the, the, the core of data science. Like how can we use the tools that we have at our disposal, disposal to the fullest extent to solve, you know, the, the big problems for business. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about my current role within United Health Group because, you know, United Health Care has some of the largest challenges for our society right now. If you think about some of the, the, the challenges not, that we've been through, not just within the last 18 months, but, you know, health inequities and, you know, cost of care, and they're probably some of the biggest societal challenges that we have uh, right now. And be able to apply data science to those challenges is is just like, um, yeah, it, it's just, how can you not get excited about that? <laughs> yeah, especially in the healthcare field. I mean, you are directly impacting lives, right? Uh, I also oh. just, oh, Liz, go ahead. Well, I mean, I'm so excited about this space. Like, of course I have more to say. Um, and, and part of the thing, part of what I love about the space that I'm in now is that I get to hear those business problems and partner uh, with all different uh, kind of sales channels and different functions in the business. So we are in oftentimes, you know, depending where we're placed in the organization, but we're in these really unique positions to learn about all aspects of the business because we're bringing our specialization to them to help turbocharge what they're doing, but we get to learn about their business problems right alongside them. And so that is, you know, for somebody who just likes to learn all the time, that's incredibly exciting. Perfect, that leads me to what I was gonna ask. You guys gave your titles, but could you just share a little bit more about what you do? You know, the office space came to mind. So what exactly do you do here? So if you could just expand a little bit for our audience as they get to know you um, and as we start to wrap up. Liz, could you share a little bit more, um, expand on what you do? Sure, so I have uh, four teams uh, in my area of responsibility. So a lot of what I do is kind of manage the portfolio of work that's there and help coach the individuals on those teams. But what are those teams? I have the, the pricing center of excellence where we seek to optimize our price uh, for um, both for the business and for the consumer. And we're using analytics to get that done. We also have the advanced analytics center of excellence, which is partnering with our business units or with, with the departments inside of our business to, like I mentioned before, turbocharge the work that they're doing with analytics. And so a lot of our work is, uh, while there's the technical component, a lot of our work is really understanding what their challenges are, what data is available today, what data do we wanna start go and capture uh, so that we can help address those problems using analytics in the future. So there are a lot of behavioral and process conversations we have as we bring this new capability inside the organization. I also have more traditional marketing research area. And what is really exciting there is you think about combining analytics and traditional research results, we're able to bring even more powerful insights to the business. And then I also have strategy. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mention strategy. Paul's, uh, it's a little bit different uh, than the other three areas I have responsibility for. However, because I, I have that strategy area, we are able to inject the insights from those other three areas into our strategy work and into our strategic planning. Liz, one thing I heard you say that matches what I hear almost any data scientist talk about is they love learning and they want to make an impact, right? And so as those of you, you know, that are with us today are considering that leap into leadership, hopefully you could hear by Liz just explaining what she does. She has impact. She's impacting an entire organization through the lens of data science and analytics, which is really awesome. Um, completely yes. transforming that. Jenny, is this where I also get to say that we're hiring? Sure. Oh yeah, if anyone would want to go work for Liz, do you have a couple openings right now? We do. We have two leadership roles that are open. So one is leading that analytics, uh, that advanced analytics COE. So if anybody's awesome. interested, feel free to reach out. <laughs> Good job. Way to, way to use the advantage of the plug. Randy, would you tell us a little bit more? I know you have a different role than Liz, right? Maybe not leading a traditional analytics organization at the moment. So tell us a little bit more about what you do as we continue to wrap up here. 
Sure. So um, United Healthcare, of course, is, is a huge company. So 300,000 employees, roughly. We have over 7,000 data scientists globally. So, so just kind of think about that. 7,000 people, just like those, just like us on the call here. Um, and, and so, you talk about continual learning. We have 7,000 plus people doing continual learning, and we want to make sure that they have the resources that they have to advance their career journey as best that they can, you know, as effectively as they can. Because the the more effective our data scientists are at their job, and and also the business teams that they work with. So our business teams have to be fluent and be able to talk to the data scientists. So we have to have that conversation. So it's um, kind of bringing the, the the business acumen to the data science teams and bringing the data science vernacular to the business teams. And so my role revolves around bringing learning opportunities to both those teams, both the business and, and the data science teams, so that uh, we can operate more effectively as an organization because we can, we, we are, 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 like I said, our com, we have a better crossover in our common language, which I, I think most data scientists will understand if they've been in this role any length of time, that there's usually a conversation gap between um, the, 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 what, how data scientists are talking and how the business stakeholders are talking. And, and, and that's oftentimes one of your biggest solves that you have to do. So we're, we're doing that at scale and that's my role is leading that effort. That's amazing. I mean, that happens in my house between me and my husband. Sometimes there's just a gap. And so to do it for 7,000 data scientists is amazing. It's funny. I was just trying to Google, right, your research, how many data scientists there are in the United States today. Um, you know, I started working with data scientists, oh gosh, seven years ago, maybe. Um, it feels like forever ago. And it just has continued to expand and expand. And one source that I saw said 11,000. And I thought, I don't think that's right. <laughs> that seems too low. Uh, so thank you for validating that. That did not seem like a good estimate. Well, that kind of wraps up our official um, kind of questioning. I do want to open it up to some audience questions, and we've had some that have come in already. So I'm going to start kind of addressing those audience questions, and we just have a few minutes left. So if you do have a question, make sure that you submit that. Uh, so Randy and Liz, the first question is, are volunteer opportunities, say, stats for good, statistics without borders, some of those type of opportunities, a good way to build a network? I see you both nodding yes. Uh, yes. Absolutely. Any, yeah, you want to expand on that? Yeah, yeah any other all, ideas of how someone can do that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good way to also build your network. So it's you kind of get a two for. So you, you can, depending on the opportunity that you have, you can use that to both develop new skills and also build your network. So you know, vo volunteering, you know, those efforts are kind of like, you have full control over that, right? Because you're, you're kind of in the driver's to, to a certain extent, you know, because you can kind of pick and choose what's going to be most um, applicable to what you're trying to accomplish. Great, Liz, anything to add? No, I, I think we yeah. give that a thumbs up. Yeah, I've had people, I've had people ask about Kaggle competitions too. Um, and you know, I run a local networking group. If anyone's in the Des Moines area, the Des Moines Data and Analytics Meetup Group, we host events every month. Um, so I don't know, meetup.com might have some in your city or, you know, there's all kinds of data scientist groups. Of course, with the past year and a half, a lot of those went virtual and it's been a little different, but um, there's always opportunities to reach out to people in your own community, in your own city that are doing what you're doing. You just gotta look for them. Uh, the next question that came in, um, you know, we've talked a lot about kind of building your skills and getting ready for that next job, but there's also this element of almost selling yourself, right? Randy talked about developing your brand before. So how do you best demonstrate to potential employers that you have leadership skills in these kinds of analytics roles, like on your resume or in interviews? How do you show a potential hiring manager that, that you've got the chaps? Liz, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm going to go back to storytelling. Uh, and being, if, if I ask you, you know, help me understand what type of problems you've solved with data science in your business that you could go from what the business problem was, the analysis that you did, the methods that you use, and then how it was pulled through to action in the business and tell that story. That's really powerful. That helps me see that you make the connection to be a thought partner with the business, not just, um, I, I often use the uh, metaphor of like, it's not just a drive-through window request uh, where you, you build a model and you hand it off, like you're able to make that connection. That's really important. Um, and if you're looking for a leadership role or considering a leadership role, 
think back to the experiences you've had and how you would package that up into a great story uh, to tell and to showcase the work you've done. Yeah, sometimes we think of ourselves, well, I haven't actually, you know, managed an intern or I haven't actually led a team before. So what stories do I have to bring to the table? And the reality is, if you want to be a leader, you're already a leader. You're leading in some way. You're leading your team in a certain area. Um, you know, you have leadership stories and it might be even in volunteer. Maybe you belong to a church or maybe it's something from a couple jobs ago or in school. So, it, you know, when you're preparing for those interviews in particular, it really is preparing those stories based on what you do bring to the table. And it might take some work to think back, um, but it might also be that you can create your story at any point in time. So if you say, boy, I don't know if I have any, well then create it, figure out if there's something that you can lead an initiative on. Uh, people are always looking for volunteers, right? Uh, so nothing's stopping you from really paving your future and doing that now. Well, um, I don't see any other questions from the audience. So, uh, you know, we'll just kind of hang for one more minute. If you do have a question, make sure that you submit it now. And then I would just like Randy and Liz to give kind of some final thoughts, like any other advice to our audience as far as how they can take this next step into the analytics leadership position. So Randy, I'll let you start. Just any other final thoughts or anything I didn't ask about that you want to add? Sure. So um, I, I think the one thing I, I'll add kind of at the end here is, um, you know, th there's different levels of leadership, you know, so there's kind of like the first level manager, then you get kind of the director and then vice president level. So there might be different people at different levels listening. Um, so, you know, all we talked about apply to different levels. But one thing I, I do want to mention that I kind of use as, as guiding is also um, a, a book that came out a few years ago. It's called Up is Not the Only Way. So, um, and that applies very well to data science. So you can do a lot of horizontal moves and expand the repertoire of, of your knowledge base um, without having every career move have to be, you know, manager, director, VP, senior VP, so, so, so on and so forth. So, you know, as, as you know, our, our listeners are thinking about, you know, what career moves they want to make, don't necessarily think that the next career move has to be a vertical promotion. It could be a horizontal move as well. So I just wanted to add that in. Great, appreciate that. Liz, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, well, Randy, we did not coordinate. We did not prep before this call. Uh, what I was going to suggest if you're um, considering a career move, whether that's a, a shift in companies or moving to uh, a leadership role, perhaps in analytics, is really stop and think, you know, what are the, this is, Coaching that I was given very early in my career and now I give it back is uh, what are five things that you're looking for in your next role? Knowing that you're probably not going to get all five of them. Um, maybe you're going to get three. Hopefully you'll get four. It'd be great if you got five. But know what those are as you start to look for opportunities because that will do just what Randy said is that you may find that there is a lateral move that gives you those experiences that you're looking for that will, I mean, in some cases, that that's the, the point that helps accelerate you into leadership roles because you've checked a few more boxes. So my encouragement is to make that list of five, not just a list of one that says I'll manage people. Boom, myth busted. You don't just have to go up, right? You can get experiences and build that resume by finding different experiences at similar levels. Well, Randy and Liz, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me and want to thank John for having us on. We do encourage all of you to find us on LinkedIn. We're all open to networking. Um, and I do have a networking tip. Don't just ask us to connect, actually send a note, right? Let us know who you are. <laughs> Um, cause it's not just about, oh, I heard you on this webinar. We have no idea who you are. So please find us on LinkedIn and let's, let's network. Let's find some connections. So John, thanks again for having us. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you guys. I mean, you, you did everything and, and put it all together and it was a really, really great uh, discussion. And, and I myself learned a lot, so I can't imagine uh, how much everybody that, that logged in to join today learned. So thank you, Jenny, for hosting Liz and Randy. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and, you know, once again, um, thanks everyone else uh, that, that was a part of this today. And, you know, as always, feel free to reach out if you have any interest in being involved in any of our sessions moving forward. Um, and look for probably around the September timeframe, some information uh, on our next, uh, our next webinar. So 
thanks everyone again. I really appreciate it. And uh, everybody have a great rest of your day and rest of your night. Thanks all. Thank you.